Welcome uh, to the 13th episode of our webinar series, Artificial Intelligence and Religion, co-organized by uh, our center, the Center for Religious Studies at Fondazione Bruno Kessler and the uh, Center for uh, Information and Communication Technology of uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler. Today's speaker is uh, Leron Schultz. Before I um, introduce our speaker, please let me remind you that this uh, this uh, uh, webinar will be recorded. So if you do not wish to be recorded, just keep your um, cameras and microphones switched off. Um, as always, we will have about uh, 25 to 30 minutes of presentation and then half an hour more or less of uh, question and answer, Q and A. Um, so let me please introduce uh, today's speaker. Great to have you here, Liron, uh, in our webinar. Um, Leron Schultz is a professor at, at the Institute for Global Development and Social Planning at the University of uh, Agda and scientific uh, director of the NORCE Center for Modeling Social Systems in Kristiansand, Nord Norway. Um, he has published extensively in various fields, in the fields of philosophy of science, computer modeling, social simulation and uh, last but not least, in the scientific study of religion. Um, let me just mention two of his uh, his two latest books. Um, in 2018, um, he published with uh, Brill the book Practicing Sa Safe Sects, Religious Reproduction in Scientific and Philosophical Perspective. And in 2019, with uh, Springer, a co-edited uh, volume, co-edited with uh, Psycho Diallo, Wesley Wildman and Andreas Tolk, entitled Human Simulation Perspectives, Insights and Applications. Um, he's the principal investigator of various projects. Let me just mention two again. Um, uh, one, uh, the first one I'd like to mention is a project of the NORCE Center for Modeling Social Systems entitled Religion, Ideology and Pro-Sociality. Um, and he is also co-principal investigator of the uh, Templeton-funded project Modeling Religious Change. Um, the title of Leron's talk today is Predicting and Preventing Religious Conflict Using Multi-Agent Artificial Intelligence. Uh, and this will bring, uh, in a sense, a new perspective on our topic of AI and religion into this webinar because so far um, talks have concentrated on um, on using religious studies uh, approaches and cultural studies approaches uh, for analyzing um, AI discourses or AI narratives. And today, I think we have uh, we will um, hear about how AI can instead be used as a tool, if you wish, I don't know if that's the, the adequate expression, in the study of religion or, or in the study of um, uh, religious phenomena. So, uh, Liron, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here with us. Um, please. Okay, thank, thank you. Let me get my... Um... Can you see that? Yes. Of course. Can you see that? Okay, excellent. So uh, for, first, uh, thank you to the Bruno Kessler Foundation and, and uh, to Boris for the invitation. And I, I have to say, Boris, you, you're the first person ever, non-Norwegian, to pronounce every Norwegian word in, in that introduction correctly. So uh, well done. And uh, there will be some religious studies uh, in the presentation insofar as um, all of our multidisciplinary teams that use AI to study religion include experts uh, in religious studies in one way or another can make that go away. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, using multi-agent AI to predict and prevent religious conflict. Uh, what I'll do first is make a few introductory comments to set the, the framework 
then I'll describe what social simulation is, specifically multi-agent artificial intelligence, what makes it uh, distinctive from other forms of AI. Then use a relatively detailed example of how we have utilized uh, multi-agent artificial intelligence to study intergroup religious conflict. And then spell out briefly some of the ethical and meta-ethical implications for the broader discussion of AI and religion. And then leave plenty of time for Q&A. I think I should be within the 25-minute uh, framework. We'll see how it goes. So first, uh, background and network. Uh, the development of these models um, is quite complex and requires a relatively large uh, multidisciplinary teams. So it's not, not possible to do without a lot of support. Um, at my university, at the University of Ogder, we have a social simulation research group, uh, which uh, develops and, and runs and coordinates several different projects. But we also have partners at the Norse Center for Modeling Social Systems. Uh, Norse is a research institute in Norway, about a thousand researchers uh, all over the country doing all kinds of different types of research. And we coordinate the social simulation aspect of that group. Uh, our key collaborators internationally are the Center for Mind and Culture in Boston and the Virginia Modeling Simulation and Analysis Center. Uh, the latter is one of the top um, US uh, institutes for modeling and simulation. And the former, uh, run by my colleague Wesley Wildman, is certainly one of the leading centers that integrates uh, cognitive scientific approaches to sociological, anthropological, uh, and economic approaches to the study of religion and other phenomena. So uh, the model that I'll be presenting today is the result of collaboration between all of those groups. Uh, we've been very uh, fortunate to get really good coverage and reactions in the media. The model that I'll tell you about today in the uh, third part of the presentation has to do with religious violence and how AI, specifically multi-agent AI, can uh, inform our understanding and even to some extent uh, predict in a, in a certain a weak scientific sense uh, the conditions under which it's most likely to occur. So understandably that uh, gets a lot of attention in the media. But it also raises ethical concerns. Every time I've ever uh, made a presentation on our models, uh, one of the first questions uh, from the audience has to do with ethics. You can see from this article in the New Scientists on our work, uh, a, a little overstatement there in the title, but then in the subtitle, the subtitle, uh, if you thought Cambridge Analytica had scary tech, wait until you see this. So that, I mean, a good press, any press is good press, but <laughs> uh, it's a little bit scary. Uh, to be framed in this sense. One of the reasons, uh, what makes us different, obviously, from Cambridge Analytica is everything we do is above board, open access, uh, and we focus on the ethical issues and making those as clear and explicit as possible. So I, I wanted to start by showing a short a two minute video. This is uh, a presentation of one of the models we've been developing with a different team on the refugee crisis in the island of Lesbos, Greece, uh, which especially was intense in 2015-16. We're developing a simulation uh, to try and understand what happened there and how future uh, refugee crises can be dealt with in more detail. So I hope everyone can hear this. It's just a couple of minutes. Leron, sorry to interrupt, but I, I'm afraid there is no audio throughput in this on this platform. So oh, okay. We, we, do not, we do not get the audio. Uh, we can see the video, but um, okay. Then I'll I'll just skip the video. Um, basically, it just tells the story uh, very briefly of the interdisciplinary team that was put together to study this crisis, and uh, describes the crisis briefly and introduces some of the researchers and sort of sets the tone for the project. Uh, uh, I'll just go ahead and move on to the next phase. Uh, the, uh, I have a, on at, at the last slide, I have a link to all of the articles that I refer to and the different institutes and uh, this video. So those who are interested uh, can go to that link at the end later and, and see the video. So uh, what is social simulation? 
a multi-agent artificial intelligence. The f first two things to say about it is how it's different from traditional AI and how it's different from game theory, which is, an, which is a form of agent-based modeling. So traditional AI, especially machine learning techniques, uh, such as those that lead to, to uh, chess playing or AI and so forth, are the simulation of an individual intelligence. So uh, uh, a sin single agent who can uh, play chess very well or read very quickly, for example, and, and analyze text. What multi-agent AI does is creates artificial societies. So not just a single agent, but uh, many agents. It can, can be hundreds, thousands, even millions of agents, all of whom are different. Uh, heter heterogeneous and who interact in social networks. So uh, those of you who might be familiar with game theoretic models, uh, they, they're also a kind of agent-based model, but uh, the, all of those that I know of have rational choice as their presupposition. So the agents in those models simply have utility functions which make them decide what's best for them in any particular interaction and, and they evolve over time. The models uh, that we develop on the other hand are psychologically realistic in sociologically realistic networks. So you can imagine, uh, again, hundreds or thousands or, or more little artificial intelligent agents who are interacting in networks. Their, their virtual minds, so to speak, are not simply making uh, rational choices, but they are like normal humans. <laughs> they are biased, they're motivated, they're part of a particular group. They may have uh, more or less religiosity, for example, uh, more or less anxiety, whatever the variables are that are relevant for the particular simulation. The environment then can be altered in different ways so that one can run simulation experiments to discover the conditions under which and the mechanisms by which the variables change. So the example we'll be using here, we'll cr we create an artificial society full of agents that are more or less religious uh, and anxious and prone to conflict under different threats. And then we alter the variables to see how the interaction between them and the different groups themselves under environmental, different environmental constraints lead to more or less religious conflict. Uh, one of the, the two things I really like about this approach, it forces conceptual clarity. So one can't simply uh, sort of vaguely say, here's what I mean by religion, or here's what I mean by conflict. You have to formalize ex precisely your variables in a way that's ex uh, ex extremely clear to everyone uh, who, reads the, who reads the model or wants to run the simulations. Also, it's multidisciplinary. So uh, as in the example I'll show you today, the model includes insights from social psychology, uh, evolutionary biology, uh, cultural anthropology, and sociology, all within a single causal architecture and that drives and guides the interaction of the agents. So this uh, enables us to grow macro level patterns or micro level behaviors where uh, this means insofar as it works <laughs> that we get to the uh, holy grail of uh, social science, not just uh, correlations between two variables, but plausible arguments for causality. In other words, you can think of the artif artificial society as a kind of uh, laboratory, uh, a social petri dish in which you can experiment and grow the phenomena you're interested in. So actually create and generate from the micro level interactions of your more or less religious agents actual mutual escalation of conflict that then has to, of course to be validated to real world data or, or you're just making it up and i'll try to explain how we do that in a minute so the the model the models that we develop are also moving beyond uh, pictures or statistics to simulations or movies. So in st uh, statistics can give you the correlation between, for example, the age uh, uh, and gender of particular individuals from a certain background who have a tendency to toward conflict without groups. And so it might give you a picture of a young men from a particular place uh, who have recently moved to Norway, who are in these networks and in 2000, 
21, here's how it looks. Here's the connection between those variables. What a simulation does is creates a movie where you can run it backwards and forwards under different, uh, altering different variables or context to test uh, ways in which those variables influence each other. So when it works, uh, policy professionals and, and other stakeholders can experiment with their hypotheses or proposals before trying them out in the real world. So you can already see some of the ethical implications, uh, whereas you, there are no other, no scientifically, ethically uh, acceptable way to put actual real people in a society and then change their religiosity or their anxiety or their the conflict and see what works. Uh, whereas in a simulation adequately uh, validated and calibrated, you can gain insights and run uh, millions of experiments with your artificial people or your simulated agents. Uh, this is just a graphic that illustrates the, the back and forth movement uh, in the process of developing a model. You have uh, data which, which you gain from the real world that might be uh, surveys or ethnographic interviews um, or, or uh, quantitative data of some kind. The theory, uh, in this case, we have theorists from religious studies uh, and international politics who, who also have theories that are shaped by and informed by empirical evidence, but that would argue about the connections between certain variables that might lead to intergroup conflict. Then the process of, oh, too fast, the process of developing the causal architecture, uh, the, the analysis of the causal architecture as it's calibrated, verified in connection to the theory as it's being programmed by your modelers, run simulations to validate whether the theory and the data are actually driving the simulations that you're running. So as, uh, as I've hinted, this requires a, a lot of teamwork. Uh, this is the, co the copy of the front cover of the book that one of the books that Boris mentioned. So we've tried to develop a method where we pull together experts uh, in computer science and in the relevant subject matter and stakeholders who are policy oriented or, or change agents and create uh, different types of particip participatory workshops so that we can develop those models to be the mo most useful and most open. And I'll, I'll be illustrating one of these uh, in the next section. So this, this is an example of how we used multi-agent artificial intelligence to study, in this case, religious conflict. We've studied uh, several other religious phenomena. The, uh, the article or it was published in the Journal for the Artificial Societies and Social Simulation. Uh, uh, Gore and Lynch there were computer scientists. Uh, Wildman and Lane are also uh, computer modelers, but experts uh, in religion. Wildman is a professor of theology and ethics. Uh, Lane has his PhD from Oxford at um, in uh, religion, anthropology of religion. And Monica Duffy Toft is, is one of the world experts on religious uh, conflict. So we have to put together teams like this to, to try and get uh, all the subject matter experts and policy oriented thinkers and computer modelers uh, to work together. So the first step in this particular model was developing what's called a system dynamics model. It, I'm not going to go through all the, the uh, lines here. The important point is, is that this is a representation of you, what you might think of as the cognitive architecture of an agent. So e uh, each individual agent starts with a certain level of religiosity. They, they have different stressful things happen to them in the simulation. They may or may not engage in rituals. The efficacy of that ritual to calm their anxiety uh, may or may not be effective. They'll get more religious or, or not. The religiosity increases and or, or goes down, up or down. This is based, this, this model uh, was based on the theory called terror management theory, which has uh, demonstrated that when people are anxious or experience uh, am ambiguous phenomena, if they're already religious especially, they're more likely to believe in supernatural agents, believe that there are hidden forces that are causing things, that, or they may come to their aid, and they're more likely to um, collapse into in-group norms and become more antagonistic toward out-group members. Uh, the terror management theory, all kinds of social, uh, social psychology experiments have, have demonstrated this. So we put in different kinds of hazards 
that from evolutionary biological point of view, we know make uh, humans anxious so that cause them to feel a uh, threat of their mortality and, and therefore can increase their religiosity and, and anxiety. So contagion, things like uh, a pandemic, for example, uh, social, um, social threats, so, so cultural others, natural threats, uh, things like earthquakes or uh, tornadoes, and predation, being eaten by a lion or, or, or killed by an enemy. So we've taken this model and, and are applying it to other issues related to, for example, uh, COVID-19, uh, spread of misinformation. Um, this model, or this first model, the first draft of this model, was focused on trying to discover when and how under different threats, people become more anxious and therefore engage in rituals that to call that cause that anxiety. So in the first version of this model, uh, also published in early 2018, we were able to simulate the emergence of phenomena such as in, in the New Zealand Christchurch, uh, Christchurch earthquake. New Zealand is an extremely secular society, but after the earthquake, uh, religious attendance or attending religious rituals uh, went up very fast, but then it slowly uh, habituated and, and went down again. And this is what typically happens. Again, what the theory would, would uh, predict. People get anxious. If they already have a high enough level of religiosity, they, they want to ritually engage with in-group members, which calms them down, and then they stop uh, engaging in the ritual once they're calm. So this model was this tier management model was updated to include uh, other theories related to religiosity and identity fusion, which I'll discuss in a minute. But I wanted to illustrate the level of clarity or operationalization that has to go on in the production of such models. So here for religiosity, we operationalized it as the, the combination of anthropomorphic promiscuity. That means the tendency, the evolved cognitive tendency to guess that there are hidden supernatural agents when one gets anxious or, or things can't be explained in other ways, or and sociographic prudery, which is the tendency to prefer the norms of your own uh, home group, to, to prefer the uh, supernatural authorities of your in-group as the best way to organize the social field. So sociographic prudery. Uh, sociographic promiscuity is more sec a secular approach that one ought to look how other norms, other groups, other norms um, shape people's thinking. And anthropomorphic prudery, this is uh, a tendency to prefer explanations, naturalistic explanations. This uh, anthropomorphic prudery tends to increase when people uh, are uh, educated scientifically or study uh, the, the humanities uh, and understand how human realities and natural realities can be explained without appealing to, to gods and other supernatural agents. So this is how we operationalize religiosity, which is one of the key variables in the model. Uh, I won't go through all the variables, but this shows you a sort of representation of the flow of the project as a whole this for the mutually escalating religious anxiety model so you can imagine those heterogeneous agents i described earlier so the each agent has a different threshold of anxiety in reaction to different threats each agent is more or less religious and a part of one or another group they're then initialized in a particular society the size of each group and the variables that impact the environment are all altered. Uh, so we uh, hundreds of thousands of simulations to, to get all kinds of different conditions. The, this, this model was based not only on terror management theory, but also social identity theory and identity fusion theory. These are both uh, social psychological theories that have also been well validated empirically, which show that uh, when people who have high levels of identity fusion or uh, social identity are more likely to engage in uh, violence against outgroup members under certain kinds of threat. Then the dependent variable, what we wanted to find out was under what, what are the conditions do, a, do agents interact so that mutually escalating anxiety occurs between the groups. So we used uh, we used data from the 30 years of the troubles in Northern Ireland between uh, the conflict between Roman Catholics and Protestants, and also a much shorter conflict in uh, the Gujarat riots in India between Muslims and Hindus in 2002. One of the key findings uh, of the, the simulation runs was that the, the green line there the most common 
uh, conditions uh, instead of mechanisms that led to an escalation of violence back and forth between the two groups was there at the top when you have the majority group is less than or equal to 70. So in other words, you're, the distribution of the population between the two religious groups is 70-30, uh, 60-40, something like that. And, uh, so not or, uh, and the contagion hazards and the social hazards or the threats from social others are uh, those threats exceed the average threshold tolerance of the the simulated agent population so when all three of those conditions hold that's when things are will tend to get the conflict will tend to get out of hand and in fact this is what one sees both in northern ireland and in gujarat this level of um, distribution of the population and the hazard intensities so what one can after demonstrating something like this it might one might say well this is kind of obvious isn't it <laughs> uh, even even if it's obvious upon uh, reflection what we've actually done is demonstrate it or grow it from the ground up so rather than saying here here are correlations or one looks at conflicts and this kind of makes sense we can say using these uh, empirically calibrated cognitive architectures in our artificial intelligence uh, agents that are networked together we've been able to which have architectures that are shaped by these theories related to threat uh, and religiosity we've been able to generate or grow the actual kind of intergroup conflict that you see in the real world so it's validated to real world data we've been able to grow it which shows we've touched on the mechanisms that actually cause intergroup conflict which which makes it a far more powerful explanatory uh, result. So to conclude uh, some ethical and meta-ethical reflections, uh, creating a model always forces you to make your assumptions extremely clear. So you have to define what you mean by religion, what you mean by conflict, uh, what you mean by uh, religious other, uh, what you mean by uh, with the different values and norms that are shaping the agents and their interactions. But it also forces you, or encourages you at least, to make your purposes clear. So someone, everyone in our group would like to reduce intergroup conflict between our religious individuals and, and groups, but someone who wanted to cause conflict between two groups could use these findings to say, now we know these are the conditions under which you're most likely to get people so anxious that they'll start violently reacting to each other. So this is true for all the models that we develop, that they can be used for, for good or evil, <laughs> as it were. Um, we try very hard in all of our models to make the, put this up front and to guide the conversation. But it does obviously raise uh, important ethical issues. When I say meta-ethics, uh, I mean not just deciding this or that is the right thing to do, but stepping back and reflecting on what we mean uh, by ethics uh, at all. And along with Wesley Mildman, uh, we've developed, uh, Wesley and I have developed a meta-ethical framework that we have uh, tried to help guide our interdisciplinary teams to be explicit about their ethical frameworks. So it has three aspects. The first is philosophical this discussion of the nature of the good and the right. So where, where do we get our norms? Uh, are, are we assuming teleology or deontological approaches? You, you, I at least was surprised how quickly and happily the computer scientists jumped on board this aspect. Of course, the religious studies experts did, but uh, everyone on the team tends to be enthusiastic about this aspect as well. The scientific, the second, the scientific aspect is that the cognitive architectures we developed, we, we argue, should be informed by biocultural sciences of religion. Uh, humans are not uh, rational actors. They have evolved to have biases, to prefer their in-group, to, to guess that there are supernatural agents around to, who might help them or punish them uh, if they don't uh, protect their in-group. And if, we, if we're gonna really simulate actual human behavior, we need to include a scientific aspect within our uh, ethical analysis of the models. So this leads to the final practical aspect, applying the first two to avoid confusion or evasion of ethical debates within social simulation. So our, our teams have tried uh, to have these discussions as we both as we're thinking about developing models, as we're running simulation experiments, and as we disseminate the models uh, to 
other scientists and to the public at large. This, this doesn't uh, guarantee that uh, <laughs> our, the models won't be used wrongly, but at least it puts everything on the table and people can criticize our assumptions and our purposes, and it provides a starting point uh, for both for scientific dialogue and public discourse. Multi-agent AI is clearly can be a very powerful tool, powerful technology, uh, which could be misused just like others, um, nuclear nuclear power or genetic engineering. Our argument has at Cambridge Analytica is an example of it being used, many would say, for evil. Uh, we want to try to get everything above board so that it can be used as much as possible for good, at least to be at the forefront of those conversations. So uh, in conclusion, um, I've put online uh, information about all the things that I've mentioned. Uh, and the video should be there as well. And once again, thank you for the invitation and attention. And I'll, we'll go to, to back to Boris. Thank you very much, Liron, uh, for this very um, interesting and rich talk. Um, we now have uh, 25 to 30 minutes for uh, Q&A. Um, please let me know when you have a question. Just drop a line in the chat. That's the safest way for me to see you. Um, uh, so I will not, and I will keep the list, uh, list and uh, uh, chair the discussion. So we have a first question from uh, Professor Marco Ventura. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, um, thank you very much, Liron and Marco from the, actually the director of the center here. So special thanks. Thank you. Um, on, on, on behalf of everyone. Um, can you tell us something more about the composition of the group or the groups you work in? Backgrounds, uh, inclination, um, specialties and approach to specialties. Are there people, uh, I would say, more vertical in their approaches or are there people more inclined to take risks in, you know, moving interdisciplinary? This kind of composition would be of, of, of interest to me. And second question, what about po policy makers? Have, have, have you been able to, to interact? And uh, what's your experience about that? And what's your, in case, what are your plans in, in, in this regard? Thank you so much. Yeah, th thank you. And thanks again for the invitation uh, from, from the foundation. Yeah, th these are great questions. And in fact, I'm just uh, today was working on uh, on an article that addresses some of these issues. And uh, it's really, it's difficult actually, because um, even though it's, uh, or at least for some of us, it's a lot of fun uh, and interesting, people are busy. And so both subject matter experts and policymakers uh, have a lot to do. And so you have to uh, tempt them into the process. Uh, to start with the first one, the, the members of our teams that, that we have been able to, to pull together, we've, I, I, we've had dozens of different teams uh, and models work together, so all kinds of different um, groups have been formed. The, this is already an ethical issue because who do you pick to be part of your team? Um, but also one has to be pragmatic. I mean, we we try to get people with as different views as possible, but if, if they're too divergent, then it collapses immediately. If they're too convergent, then everyone agrees and it's no fun. You also have to get people who are open to interdisciplinary work. Uh, there's just no hope in getting some, some individuals are just not ever gonna wanna engage in this kind of activity. So that automatically excludes uh, excludes them, at least initially. So what we try to do, especially through Wesley's uh, Center in Boston, is create explanations uh, of the models that are, are as clear and public oriented as possible to try to draw people into the conversation after the models are developed. That's not ideal, but, it, but it, at least it's a step. Uh, with policymakers, um, here too, it's it's difficult. Our experience and the experience of other teams around the world who have tried to do this it, is that it always goes better if you can get policymakers in from the very beginning because they ha they have ownership to the construction of the model and they're more likely to use it. Uh, th that typically requires a lot of funding because uh, unless you have super motivated public policymaker uh, because you have to buy out their time uh, or at least uh, fly them to engage in the meetings. So we've had uh, relative success in that in some of our models. Some of our models have been purely scientific, so they've not engaged 
a policymakers at all yet. Uh, so, so my answer to your question is it's extremely difficult and uh, we're learning how to do it better as we go along, but also uh, being pragmatic that we have to at some point say, all right, this is the team we can put together, be honest about the assumptions and limitations of that group and, and be clear about those. Thank you again, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from uh, Robert, Robert Gerati. Hi there. Uh, Hi. Thank you. That was really absolutely fascinating. I really think that, that what you're doing is really interesting work. I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit on um, the modeling process, like how you assign weights to you know, particular phenomena, you know, whether it's someone's anxiety levels or whatever else, like how you put weight, how you weight things in the model and then how you iteratively, you know, fix those with, you know, like how do you figure out where to make the tweak and okay, we're not matching up with empirical reality, but like somehow we think we can. So could you talk a little more about that process? Um, because I think this kind of work, like thinking about how to use these kinds of technologies to make us do better work in religious studies is just incredible. Like, I'm really impressed. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> See, as I think my enthusiasm spills over even when I try to hide it. Um, so so the, the tasks that you've described here are typically called calibration and validation. And, and I mean, it's um, piecemeal, step-by-step uh, -step work. We're, we're, I mean, we have tried to develop models which have just colossally failed <laughs> after after enormous work and putting together good teams. And it's just, it just doesn't work. So, um, and this is good news because if it always worked, then it, there would be suspicion you're cooking the books. You know what I mean? You're making it work. Um, to, to make it really work, you have to do these two things that you just described. Um, the first is deciding how to wait the variables and the interactions between variables. So, so typically these might involve uh, differential equations that, that connect the causal links between two variables. Uh, so, so this is a debate between subject matter experts which bring the, the different empirical evidence that they have. So for example, let's say to what extent do people, when they're, they're, uh, they become salient of their morality, to what extent does their religiosity go up and religiosity meaning what? Their belief in supernatural agents uh, or, or their ritual, ritual engagement, right? So then the experts say, based on these social psychological experiments or these interviews, here's how we think this, this causes that, right? And then when that happens, then that causes this and other mem group members and this reaction. So it's very complicated architecture. Each one of those connections then has to be calibrated. So you, you just keep running the model until it pops out something that, it, that, makes, that makes at least broadly speaking some sense. Once, once you've done that, then you can start tweaking and validating it. That's when you go to, to macro level real world data. So then the goal is from that calibration more at the micro level, right, the in individual interactions, can we get from that the, the emergence of macro level, in this case, intergroup conflict? And if I remember correctly, we, we were able to, to simulate within 2% within accuracy, or 98 point something percent accuracy, uh, 30, 30 years of mutually escalating conflict between uh, Roman Catholics and Protestants uh, in Ireland, which is really remarkable accuracy uh, from the model. So I, I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you very much. Boris, is it okay if I just follow up with one kind of additional question? Sure. sure. Okay. Uh, so you probably know that like a million years ago, Bill Bainbridge did the, you know, he took his, his model for the development of religion and then he tried to use AI to see if he could generate using that exchange model. Could he generate, you know, belief in gods? Uh, and it was all really quite interesting. Um, and I'm curious, but, but then it seemed like there was this enormous gap, right? Where nobody in, in the study of religion was really engaging in that. Uh, that kind of work, and I don't do it, so I'm <laughs> I'm not casting stones on my colleagues um, or at my colleagues. But what do you think might be kind of the future? Like, if you look bigger than just you know the like the big picture, the whole field. Like, how could we collectively rethink what we're doing through these kinds of collaborations, um, these kinds of networks building with people in computer science and so forth? Uh, how can AI make us do our work better? 
Yeah. Well, help uh, again, us yeah, yeah, another great question. So f first, um, you're absolutely right in the history of the development of the application of uh, computer modeling to religion. Uh, it was Bainbridge early on uh, and then nothing for a long time. And then in the, the early or the sort of uh, 2000, mid 2000s, there were several, probably maybe a total of 10 or something between 2005 and 2015. Uh, and, then, and then it s sort of took off. Uh, we uh, and our, our teams have led many of those. We've gotten lots of good sized grants to pull together teams. And on the religious studies side, you, you may know the American Academy of Religion has um, uh, a group on AI and religion. So there's the growing interest there. Uh, and actually, two of the groups I think the Cognitive Science of Religion group and uh, the Mystical Experience group, if I remember this year, have calls that have to do with uh, how AI. Uh, could be could be relevant, so so that's good news. There's a growing interest. Um, as I as I hinted earlier, it's it is difficult work, and it takes it typically takes funding to pull off, uh, and it takes people who are willing and interested. Our experience is that when we do bring religious studies people in. Uh, universally and unanimously, they get so excited, and they they actually say something like, "I understand my own theory." Uh, better than I did before. So you may know the name Ann Taves. Uh, we did a model with her uh, and others. They, they come in and their own theories are clarified as, as they do the work. And then, of course, the capacity to simulate uh, an experiment is, is something that can't can't be done in other types of methodologies. So the the National Academy, I wouldn't know, is it the North American uh, Society for the Study of Religion, Nasser. Um, we, uh, Wesley and I and a couple of others on our team did a panel for them at, at their uh, November meeting where we talked about how some of these models uh, can be used to study religious, uh, different religious phenomena. So we've studied not just um, mortality salience, but we've studied the, the role of religiosity in the, the shift from hunter-gatherers to, to uh, sedentary agriculture in, in the Neolithic uh, to study the emergence of the axial age in uh, the southeast and west asia uh, in the first millennium before the current era to study uh, post supernatural cultures so the shift to modernity where you have uh, secularism uh, taking over in many contexts uh, we've done models on rituals all kinds all kinds of uh, all kinds of interesting models e each of which had relevant experts to do that hard calibrating validating work that you were describing Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, if I may, I might I, I, I put myself on the list. Um, I see no other question at the moment. So, yeah, I take it that I can ask a question. Um, great. Um, um, I have I have two points. The, the first one regards again the the uh, um, operationalization of of higher order concepts like like religiosity and anxiety and so on so um i i'm not quite sure i, I got the because you introduced uh, the way in which you uh, operationalized uh religiosity but I, I did not quite get it i i, I think so maybe, maybe maybe you could just uh, uh, uh say a few more words about that and then regarding um the second point regards uh multi-agent uh ai um i mean as from the little that I know about uh, multi-agent AI, um, I mean, there's this broad distinction between collaborative and uh, uh, co or cooperative and uh, uh, strategic or competitive behavior, where, for instance, um, what would count as rational in a collaborative environment uh, can be quite different from what could count as rational in, in, a, strate in a merely a purely strategic environment. So I was wondering how how do you make these many artificial agents or individuals interact and choose also their 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 I mean in some sense they, they such in such a multi-agent system there should be change in attitudes also from strategic to collaborative and vice versa for instance. And and then I mean um the my main uh, so I just wonder, I mean, all these things, when you look at religious conflict, for instance, or religious conflicts, 
these things have to be extremely contextualized. For instance, they have religious or conflicts with partly religious uh, um, uh, motivations are in most cases also caused by, by other factors like economics, like uh, linguistic uh, diversity, cultural diversity, and, and so on. And so, so how, to, how do you put all this stuff into your models? I mean, that, that seems to me uh, like, that's, that's uh, quite unbelievable. <laughs> that's, that's yes, I mean. yes, and, and you shouldn't believe it because we don't <laughs> put okay. everything in the model. So okay. maybe, maybe let, me, let me start there, and if, if I forget something, uh, come back to it. So, so one of the most um, common phrases you'll hear in the modeling and simulation ex uh, community is uh, a quote from uh, one of the founders many decades ago, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So, so if you think of uh, a map, for example, if, um, if I needed a map to drive here from uh, Christiansand to uh, up north to Oslo, then I wouldn't want, I wouldn't need the map and I wouldn't want the map to have every blade of grass and every mole hill, right? I just would need it to have uh, the mountains <laughs> and the rivers and the road, right? I would need, need the map to be adequately uh, narrow to, to include the elements and the variables that will get me, that will be useful to get me from here to Oslo, right? It, would, it wouldn't be useful to have all of these other uh, small kinds of variables. So in the same way, one of the judgments you have to make throughout the process of uh, creating a model is how, how you want it to be uh, simple enough, but not too simple, right? Complex enough, but not too complex. And this, th there's both an art and a science to this. The subject matter experts also play a role here uh, in deciding that. But in the model that I described, the specifically political and economic uh, variables are not present. Uh, in some other models we have, they are. Uh, th there are different ways technically of referring, uh, of, ex of explaining and referring to which variables that, that one does and doesn't want to include. But in this particular case, we, we were able just with the variables and mechanisms we had to, to get to Oslo, as it were, <laughs> if you see what I mean. So this doesn't mean this doesn't mean that we've captured every mechanism or, or every condition, right, or every relevant variable, but it does mean that that we've captured at a broad scale some of the key conditions and mechanisms that do have a powerful force in in driving uh, uh, conflict between two groups. So um, when it comes to operationalization, maybe this will will shed light on that. Um, those of you in religious studies, and I, I was have in religious studies for decades, you know that the definition of religion uh, is extremely contested <laughs> uh, and contentious. And many people don't even want to use the word religion it, for, for reasons that are understandable. It's a reification of a whole lot of phenomena that have to be fr fractionated. Um, but in order to create a model, you have to say very specifically what what you mean. So the de the Operationalization means he, here's the way religion as a function is, is operating in the model. So we took, we, we're, we're not claiming that we've defined religion or we've get, got at the essence of religion or any of those issues, but we've said two variables that are typically connected in the scientific study of religion to, to uh, cognitive or coalitional mechanisms are first what I broadly referred to as anthropomorphic promiscuity. So this this refers to the, the class of uh, evolutionary tendencies, which are things like uh, to get, guess that things have a purpose of agent behind them, uh, just, uh, or to uh, see human-like forms, so faces in the clouds, uh, or to um, guess, especially under, under threat, that there's a predator or something hidden that, that's going to get you, especially um, belief in punitive supernatural agents. Arguably, uh, many many theories in the scientific study of religion argue that this belief itself had a kind of adaptive value in helping groups uh, cooperate more. Uh, so that if you believe that there were hidden agents watching you, you were more likely to follow the norms of your in group and to to support your in group, which then of course made you the group itself more competitive against out-group members. Uh, its individuals then would be less willing to share resources under conditions of scarcity and more willing to, to uh, kill out-group members uh, uh, when, when threatened in a certain way. So anthropomorphic promiscuity 
captures those variables. Uh, sociographic prudery, the, so this is um, the tendency to believe and prefer that the best way to organize the social field so, uh, or graph the socius, if I can put it that way, sociographic prudery, I, I, I want to stay home, I want, I'm prudish, I don't want to date other cultures, I don't want to get to know other groups. The revealed texts or the supernatural authorities of my group, my shaman, my priest, uh, so forth, uh, my holy texts, they have the answer for how to organize the social field, right? The, that's sociographic prudery. So there's a whole set of coalitional tendencies that are that are behind that. It's kind of a class of uh, tendencies. So in order to have a definition of religiosity that, that was coherent and usable, that's the one we use, ha have used in several of our models. But we've used different definitions of religion or different variables that influence uh, what's commonly called religiosity uh, in other models. So you're absolutely right in your intuition that none of these models includes everything. It, it would, there would be no point in having a map that included everything from here to Oslo. You, you just would have the real world, right? So that um, all models, even not in the study of, of um, religion, but models of physics or uh, mathematical models in, in chemistry and in other disciplines, they try to abstract and have only the, the necessary variables and, and mechanisms to produce the phenomena of interest. And if they're able to do that, then, then that's more, more effective. If you have too many variables, then you lose cognitive control. You have no idea what's causing what. So I, th I think the one aspect of your question that I didn't answer directly was the tension between cooperative and competitive. Uh, I hinted at it, but uh, clearly, uh, Con the religion plays a role in both. Uh, on the one hand, religious rituals and the, the norms and shared beliefs uh, help a particular group uh, feel um, what Durkheim would call collective effervescence, right? The totem uh, of the group that reinforces a sense of uh, in-group or parochial pro-sociality or cooperation. But under certain conditions, the dark side of that is competition without groups uh, when the, the sacred values are, or the two types of collective effervescence come into conflict, which they tend to under certain political or economic uh, forces, can, can lead those, those cognitive defaults to spill over uh, into violence between groups. Th thank you very much, Leron. Um, the next question is from Inken, Inken Paul. The hey, hey. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, Leron, nice to see you. I nice think to meet I'm you. Uh, um, yes, I think so. But anyway, so I'm super impressed um, by your talk, and but I'm also super, super skeptical. And um, I would like to. Um, my question points at the same in the same direction as uh, Robert's and uh, Boris's question. But from another angle, uh, I'm from religious studies, but particularly from material religion. So I mix, I think that religions only work with bodies, emotions, materialities, the senses, all that stuff. What men tend to overlook, by the way. <laughs> and uh, you probably know that. And so, again, in your talk, um, we heard a lot about when it comes to religion, about answers, beliefs, concepts. And so I'm wondering, how do we get um, all this emotion, materiality, sense of stuff into the matrix? Mm. Is that even possible? And could it be that um, the concepts you talked about are, as it is generally criticized by uh, feministic approaches, that the digital humanities are just doing the same uh, what the well, all the humanities did before, and not looking into the yeah. material and emotions. Yeah, fan fantastic question. Uh, I skipped over. I skipped over uh, earlier some points that I think would go to uh, go to your question. The first is, uh, and I went through this really quickly. The difference between traditional AI and multi-agent AI. Traditional AI. It, the, the white men who started AI were interested in how to read really fast or, or play chess better, right? Uh, Multi-agent AI, the agents are embodied, 
they are inactive they're in communities they they ha have is in the case of this one they have emotions like anxiety uh, which go up and down they're they're weighted in terms of their concern for their in-group members some of our other uh, models have other kinds of emotions um, th this one also has a sense of fusion or connection to your group some of our some of our models to have uh, different genders um, the the obviously people uh, women and religion uh, and men lots of research showing different ways of uh, interacting and experiencing religion the rituals themselves are also uh, embodied uh, and inactive uh, driven uh, again by emotions so there each it's not that um, every agent has all the rich set of emotions <laughs> or embodied features that a real human does right so, so every model is wrong in that sense uh, but it still can be useful insofar as our embodying and active uh, e emotional agents, g given the key sort of architectural uh, mechanisms with, within them, as they interact with each other in, in a spatio-temporal, a simulated spatio-temporal uh, field, those interactions, dr driven again by uh, social psychological understandings of, of emotion, uh, em different kinds of emotions, drive macro level interactions, macro level phenomena such as such as in this case conflict or even the change of civilizational form, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the emergence of the axial age. So, uh, when as I mentioned, I was um, a religious studies uh, scholar for for decades before I ever heard of computer modeling. And when I first heard of it, I was extremely skeptical. Uh, and uh, working on it now for a few years, I, I know I know the underbelly <laughs> and where it doesn't where it doesn't work and it, that, its failures and its limitations. Uh, and some and some of them are connected to what you're describing. We are working on and continue to work on making the architectures, the, the emotional architectures of our agents richer. The the challenge here is related to the earlier question. Is, is the if you include too many variables, then it's just a mess, right? It's just uh, going in every direction, and you have no idea what's causing what. So the goal is to have adequately emotionally um, articulated agents in adequately uh, social networks with the capacity to behave and move uh, closer to each other and engage in, in behaviors that influence each other, both within the group and themselves and out group members. To, to make it complex enough, but still simple enough that you can understand through the, the exploration of the state space of the computer model, what, what is actually causing, uh, which variables are actually have a causal relation to other variables. So, so what it doesn't, if I can just take this opportunity to say this too, this, this particular methodology does not replace the qualitative um, uh, hermeneutic, uh, ideographic, detailed, sophisticated, philosophical analysis of uh, most religious study, religious study scholars. Uh, it, it is quantitative, uh, but we work hard to incorporate the qualitative uh, into the model. So you might think of it as a kind of quantitative sculpting of the qualitative, uh, but, it, but, it's, but still you're not, uh, it, it just, every method can't do everything. So we we are not getting into the deep uh, interpretation of a text or uh, a long interview with someone or ethnographic um, uh, sort of engagement or embodiment within it within a group. Th 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 this method can't do that. What it can do is take insight, some insights gleaned from all that research, uh, quantify it, and show us something. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I see one more question in the in the chat uh, from Anita Sarno. Uh, you you you. Yes, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, actually, my first uh, question was already uh, answered uh, because my my first question was how to deal with some factors like uh, judgment, compassion, and empathy, and the other question is. Uh, which is the average percentage of level of conflict you found in your models? Like you found more collaboration cases or more competition and so conflicts. I don't know if it's clear. 
Uh, do, do you mean, uh, uh, I, I, can you reframe the question? I'm not sure I understand. Yes, uh, okay, in, in your simulations, uh, mm -hmm. did you find, I mean, which is the average percentage of the level of conflict that you found? Like, it, it's something common, like from your... Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so the average, I, I couldn't, I couldn't answer that question uh, directly because every, the answer is different for every simulation. Yeah. So, so uh, the level of conflict, just like the level of anxiety and the way in which religiosity and the, the behaviors uh, and, and emotional reactions and uh, behavioral engagements of the agents will be different every simulation. So, so we run uh, hundreds of thousands of simulations under different conditions. So uh, one simulation might have 1% of the population is one religious group and 99% is the other. And then another simulation 50-50, you know, and everything in between. In one simulation, you initialize it that everyone has really high religiosity to start with and another really low religiosity, and another different. So the, the distributions of anxiety of all the variables are different in every single simulation. So the, so the average will be different depending on the conditions. So after running uh, many, many simulations, what we found is if you, if you want the average to pop over a threshold so that the two groups are in conflict, the conditions under which that's most likely to happen are around 70-30 population split, and the two specific threats uh, in the environment that, that drive it are contagion and so, uh, social otherness. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, so it's uh, 5 p.m. We should stop here, I think. Uh, Leron, thank you very much for your fascinating talk. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who uh, joined us today, participated in the discussions, or just uh, listened and followed um, uh, the talk and the discussion. Let me just anticipate that um, our next uh, um, our next uh, webinar episode will be actually the last one of the series. So today's was the, uh, the last regular talk webinar um, in our series. And we will meet again at, on uh, April 21st for a panel discussion on um, uh, directions of future research on artificial intelligence and religion. And of course, we will keep you updated. Uh, I will send, uh, we will send out details on the program of that um, last webinar um, in our series very soon. Uh, so thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Leron. Thank you to everyone and hope to see you again uh, in April. Thank bye you. bye. Thanks again.